Um, so the purpose of this talk tonight, and I'm gonna go share a boring PowerPoint, uh, if the Zoom gods let me, and now I don't have to look at my face anymore, which is nice, um, is Legacies of 1620 and the Mayflower, uh, Native Americans of New England. And it is the 400th anniversary in whatever shape or form we are celebrating this or commemorating this is maybe a better word. Uh, <clears throat> and so my talk engages with that and sort of the impact, the legacies that this coming of the Mayflower had uh, on the native people. And I will start out by pointing out that the Mayflower was only about 100 people that survived the trip of these 100 people, about 50% died during the first year. Uh, so it's a very insignificant number. And the, um, the Puritan separatists or pilgrims that they are, as they're sometimes called starting in the 18th and 19th century, these Puritan separatists kind of play a larger than life role in American history and American myth-making. So they are, they're, they become celebrated as these saints and creators of a nation, or they become vilified as these genocidal, uh, that's, the, that's, that's the spread. I think the Puritans were neither saints, uh, nor were they genocidal maniacs. Um, but the Puritans have come to stand in for our talk today because this is the first English speaking permanent colony that is established in New England and therefore it becomes a founding moment of New England. But we also have this little holiday called Thanksgiving, right? And <clears throat> Thanksgiving uh, became a federal holiday uh, during the American Civil War when Abraham Lincoln uh, declared it to be an American civil holiday, or in a sense, in an effort to bring a divided nation together. And with this celebration of the Thanksgiving holiday and this uh, weird dinner that uh, Native American and Puritan separatists had after the founding of, of New England, we have had this creation of an American tradition. And for many people, American uh, society Pilgrims or the Puritans have sort of become one with the founding of America. And of course, people in Virginia have other things to say, not to speak of all the Spanish and French colonies that existed way before that. But here we are. But so my talk is really not about the Mayflower. It is not really about Thanksgiving. It's not really about um, 1620, but it is rather about processes of colonization and the um, experiences of native people uh, that were caused by these processes of colonization that the Mayflower becomes sort of as the st a stand in for our title. Um, and we're talking about, we'll be talking tonight about the historical legacies uh, that have been caused by this event, uh, 1620, and the following processes of colonization that, that followed after the arrival of the, of the Mayflower. So one of the visible legacies we have, um, and yep, um, one of the visible legacies we still have today in Massachusetts is of course our state seal, which has been in the news somewhat lately, uh, there is a movement to abolish the state seal. I'm not really in the business of telling you whether the state seal needs to be abolished or not. Uh, what I always tell my students applies to you even more. You are adults, the decision is yours. But what my job is a, as a historian is to kind of explain and contextualize what the seal stands for. And so the seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, from the 17th century, you see that here on the uh, right-hand side. 
And it's of course this naked Native American, this naked Massachusetts in Indian covered by leaves and holding a arrow facing downwards, which is supposedly a sign of peace. And he says, come over and help us. And of course he means the Puritans uh, that founded the Northern neighbor of Plymouth colony, the Massachusetts Bay colony, uh, which Salem was incidentally one of the first uh, um, beachheads to create this colony. Um, and it's sort of this that serves as the, as the, um, as the founding document of our current state seal. And when I discussed this with my students, which I have been for 20 some years, because I always thought the, uh, the, uh, 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 um, <clears throat> it's, uh, they generally say, yeah, naked Native American doesn't really make all that sense. We go outside today in really cold weather in November. Dressing like this makes no sense. So we compare it to the newer, the student's reaction always is, yeah, the Native American is dressed. He looks more respectable. And, but when you look at the state seal, there are quite a few, I don't want to call it hidden meanings, but the designer of the seal, he put a lot of uh, thought, the illustrator, Edmund Garrett, put a lot of thought into it when he designed the seal. And as a historian that, that specializes in indigenous colonial relations, I find these the seal very interesting in terms of when you intellectually examine what's going on here. Well, well let's start with the body, right? The body of the Native American that's depicted in this uh, picture was pulled out of an archaeological site in Winthrop, Massachusetts. And that was sort of the, the body that was used to uh, depict the Native American body on the seal. Now, the weird thing is, the head is a Native American from Montana. And sort of the belief that we had, and we'll explore this throughout the talk, in Massachusetts and other New England colonies that by the mid 19th century, late 19th century, uh, mainstream New English society had come to believe in Southern New England that Native Americans had vanished or that they had disappeared. And therefore you couldn't, go to an indigenous community, which we still had some in Southern New England at the time and, and get an, a facial depiction of a Native American. But Garrett decided we needed to get a Native American from Montana to become the depiction of a Southern New England, English Massachusetts Indian. Now, <clears throat> this is sort of the, 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 the sort of the icing on the cake. So we have a body, we have a head. Uh, over the head, of course, hangs a sword, which is based on the sword of Miles Standish. And again, as a historian of English colonial relations, indigenous colonial relations, uh, I find this rather interesting and rather interesting choice. Because one of the first engagements, military engagement that at uh, Miles Standish leads uh, alongside the Wampanoag Indians is against the Massachusetts Indians. And one of, one of the things that happens during this engagement, there is a Massachusetts Native American um, that has his head cut off and the head is piked outside of Plymouth Plantation. And that was a very um, normal thing to do, part of uh, English warfare, this trophy taking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I guess it's been in the, uh, in the media as of late too, because a former advisor of one of the presidential candidates has advocated this as a policy, which I think got him either kicked off of Twitter or Facebook. I don't really know, I, I'm on neither. So um, I like living in the 17th and 18th century. People were nasty there, but at least they weren't nasty on social media. Um, so, <clears throat> Long story short, sword above head, head decapitated or disconnected from body, seems a little weird. The other thing that's really weird, when you look at the belt that the Native American wears on the picture, uh, that's uh, a, the belt of Metacom. Uh, and Metacom was also known as King Philip. 
he was one of the leaders of an anti-colonial uh, resistance uh, by Native Americans in the 1670s. And Metacom um, also had his head chopped off and his head was piked outside of Plymouth Plantation uh, for I think about two decades. That must have been a gruesome sight. Um, but again, so to lots of Native Americans, the seal is kind of offensive. Uh, and, and I understand where they're coming from. So is it all about political correctness or, um, or should we do something about this in Massachusetts? Uh, this is for other people to decide. Another interesting um, issue is the, um, the motto that, uh, the motto that you have on the side, by the sword we seek peace, by the sword we seek peace. I wanna leave this aside, uh, but we'll pick up by the sword we seek peace in just a minute, because that is another sort of visible legacy or one of the legacies of the, uh, of the Mayflower and of 1620. So we're done with the seal. Uh, other legacies, the intellectual legacies, are how Native Americans in New England have been depicted in New English literary culture and writing. And there is a lot of tropes that uh, depict Native Americans. There's the myth of the New English wilderness. There's the myth of virgin land, so that this was an empty continent. No one was here. There's the myth that Native Americans that inhabited this land were nomads. And time and time again, these show up in 18th, 19th and early 20th century history. And it seems like these histories, these local histories repeat each other. Um, but when you actually look at the archeological history or uh, before uh, the archeological history of pre-Columbian New England, uh, New England is very much a place of ecological stability, uh, very vibrant fish population, uh, both in the rivers, uh, the lakes, ponds, as well as in the ocean. Um, it's a world of tremendous social complexity. So Native Americans have diverse forms of, of government and social organization. Uh, it is an area uh, in which Native Americans are not nomads, but they practice agriculture. They also practice what is, uh, they also practice landscape management. So they um, burn down the undergrowth to make uh, for more efficient hunting. So there is a high degree of landscape management. The reason why Native Americans do this is there are no domestic animals in New England other than the dog. And so in order to get protein in their diet, they can get, they fish and they do a lot of that. But in order to get meat in their diet, hunting is really, hunting is really the only way they can get meat in their diet. But when you think about how entire underbrushes are burned down, landscapes are managed to spur the growth of grass, to increase the deer population, more moose population, turkey population, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is this really hunting at this point or is this maybe a form of free range pasture raising that some hipsters could probably get very excited about as some like organic way of raising meat. Anyway, so agriculture, landscape management, free range pasture, social complexity, ecological stability in a sense of sustainability. We could learn a lot from the indigenous populations of New England. Native Americans participate in long distance exchange networks that connect these indigenous populations with the mound builders and the large cities of the Midwest and the South that are the same size as European population centers. So we have a complex history of over 10 millennia uh, maybe 12, maybe 14 millennia uh, that, that, are, uh, that are part of New England's history before the Mayflower. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to, to point out. Uh, okay. 
So what are these legacies of colonization? There are legacies of colonization, but they're also uh, legacies of survival. And so the first part of the talk today, I, I'll spend or I have spent and will spend a lot of time talking about the legacies of colonization. By the second part of the talk, I will focus on the survival of indigenous people in the Northeast, which is also a very important part of the New England story and kind of is counterposed to the head that we had to bring in from Montana. Um, so this is a history of, of disease. Uh, not having domestic animals is really a, creates a biological uh, challenge and a demographic challenge for Native Americans. So in other words, um, even before the pilgrims or the Puritan separatists arrived, there have been massive disease outbreaks. So um, New England's indigenous population suffered losses from anywhere between 50 to 90% and probably closer to 90% uh, as a result of contacts throughout the 16th and the 17th century. So there was a demographic catastrophe that is going on. In fact, the um, Puritan separatists that settled at Plymouth, they moved right on the location of a very well-known Native American city settlement that is called Patuxet. And Patuxet shows up in the colonial records. For example, um, uh, Champlain, the French explorer and, and, and founding colonist of, uh, of, of New France, um, he refers and describes uh, Patuxet as a major trade uh, city and a, a significant population center in, in Southeast, what is today Southeastern Massachusetts. And we even get indications in, in the historic record. So if you read Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation and the accounts of other New English colonists, they often mention the fact that A, all the farm fields are clear. Native Americans live there because there's a great harbor. There's still remnants of the Witus, the houses that uh, uh, southern, uh, that Eastern Algonquians built in Southern New England. There is also evidence of bones and skulls on the ground, which is an indication uh, that something must have gone horribly wrong at Patuxet. Because Patuxet, or because Eastern woodland native people, and especially the native people of New England, would under most circumstances bury their dead. The bones of the ancestors are sacred. Burial grounds are, for lack of a better word or using a Western word, they are sacred. They are not to be touched. So the first thing you do with a dead body is to bury it so that you uh, make things right. So. To make a long story short, the fact that Native Americans did not bury their dead is a pretty strong indication of that something horrible had happened here and that Patuxet had been abandoned. It had either been completely wiped out due to disease or the survivors were so scared to go back there that they just did not take care of the dead body. But so it's an indication of the kind of trauma that must have happened right as the um, Puritan separatists arrived on the Mayflower. Slavery is another part of the story. One of the most famous uh, citizens of Patuxet is a Native American named Squanto. And I'm sure you all heard of Squanto. Uh, he's quite the American uh, cultural figure. Uh, but the question is always, now how did Squanto learn such great English to help and be able to communicate quite fluently 
between um, the English, the Puritan separatists, and the Wampanoag Indians. And that comes to our second legacy of colonization. After disease, it's slavery. We talk a lot about 1619 and the impact this had on American slavery, but what we tend to forget in this, uh, in this comparison is also the role that 1620 and really sort of English colonization in New England and the Northeast played in the making of slavery. So people like Squanto were captured and sold on the slave markets of the Atlantic world. Now Squanto was lucky, some missionaries sprung him free via Spain, he eventually came to England. He worked in the house of a, of a rich uh, English investor who also happened to be funding a lot of the um, colonization efforts in, in the Americas and through various complex trips made his way back was sprung free by a group of Native Americans led by another uh, escaped uh, slave or servant of the English. Uh, and eventually he ended up in his Southern uh, New England homeland again. And uh, that is part of the story of slavery. But the story becomes even more uh, problematic if you like me to use this word, or even more complex when we look at the history of slavery in American society. And this is that it is also Massachusetts Bay Colony that becomes the first American colony, English speaking American colony that puts slavery on the book. And this event too is very much connected to the history of Native Americans in New England. So in the 1630s, you have a conflict that is called the Pequot War. The Pequots uh, got in a little bit of a kerfuffle. And I think most historians argue today that they were really pushed into a war with the New English and the New English exploited that. They were assisted by Native American allies like the Narragansett and the Mohegans which had it out for the Pequot because they had sort of been ascendant in what is today Connecticut and Southern New England. Make a long story short, there's nasty massacres, like for example, at Mystic where 500 people are burned and slaughtered alive, uh, most of them women and children. But part of the Pequot war is also that the English take a lot of what they call war captives. And they bring them back mostly to Plymouth, but mostly to Massachusetts Bay Colony. And it's the, the founding fathers like the Winthrops and, and other Puritan elite families that sort of start a debate on, so what are war captives? The war captives for the Romans became slaves. Should we do this as well? Some people say, no, we are, we're Christians, we can't enslave. Well, there is precedent that Christians enslaved other people so we can do it. And so there's this whole intellectual discussion going on after the Pequot War about how to deal with these Native American war captives that very much has an influence on the thinking of and the legal implementation of slavery in Massachusetts Bay Colony, which is sort of a, a leading leader for then other colonies to follow. And also what is done, many of the, several of the Pequots are also sold into the Atlantic slavery. And that brings in a, a flux of some people of African descent, which then again further uh, spurs this discussion. Now we have these Native American war captives, we have some people of African descent, what should we do with them? And that very much spurs uh, the debates on slavery. There's the issue of dispossession of land, which, which is a dramatic part of, of New England history. Uh, New English want native land, and, and here we go, which also leads to dismantling of communities. But it's also important to point out, despite this often cruel, violent history, Native people adapt, they show great resilience, and they attempt throughout this 400 year history to maintain their sovereignty and uh, their power, and to, to maintain as much control as they can in their communities. Uh, 
I promise you I would get back to by, by the sword we seek peace, our, our state motto. And again, to, as a historian of indigenous colonial relations, to me, it's very interesting how the by the sword we seek peace really, in a sense, encapsulates the history of New England. Uh, New England colonization is very much pushed for by war, uh, for, with, by war pushed for by English colonies against the native population. So uh, one example here is uh, King Philip's War, but I could have picked uh, the King William's War, Queen Anne's War, Dummer's War, uh, not named because the war is dumb, but it's named after a, a, a governor Dummer. I told you the jokes won't get any better on Zoom. Uh, King George's War, the Seven Years' War. Make a long story short. We'll just look at King James, uh, I'm sorry, at King Philip's War as a, um, a sort of a, a little exploration uh, point. So King Philip's War in Southern New England is really detrimental to the position of native people. Probably by the time of the Mayflower arrival, the indigenous population is estimated about at 140 to 120,000. According to Daniel Gookin, who was a, a Puritan colonist and who knew a lot about Native Americans. By the time around 1670, that population had shrunk down to 30,000. Some of that is Pequot War, some of that is, is slavery, but a lot of this has to do with disease. And the English population, in New England at this point was about 50,000. So already the cards are pretty much well stacked. So um, the Puritan historians, of course, proclaim King Philip's war was caused by, by Native Americans, mainly this guy named King Philip, but the, war, the, the way into the war is a lot more complicated. Uh, Puritan colonists forced uh, Native Americans to disarm. There was pressure on land, there was dispossession. Uh, English animals were feeding on, on, on Native American farm fields. So there's a lot of crop destruction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To make a long story short, uh, what happened at King, Philip's, at King Philip's War was a powder keg that had been building for a while and it just came to explode. Um, some historians estimate that, and this is recent historiography that has come out, that as many of the 30,000, that out of those 30,000, Set of seven out of 10 Native Americans uh, in Southern New England uh, disappear or get killed or die as a result of that war. Some end up in the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, some end up fleeing up north into exile, but many die on, uh, on the battlefields or as a result of warfare or as a result of slavery, as I already pointed. So it is an extremely violent war. Other historians have said it's like 50%, uh, but no matter what. The other thing that is going on, uh, if you go down to Deer Island, um, there's a massive internment camp where a lot of the Christian Indians uh, from the praying towns are put into. Uh, so we have this, uh, what, what some local or what many Native Americans in New England call you have a concentration camp that is going on. And so these had been, in fact, Native Americans that had just fought alongside Massachusetts Bay Colony in the early battles of the war. Then Puritan colonists got a little scared and they wanted all Native Americans to be put on the island. And the only ones that they could capture were the Christian Indians. And so they were told Go on this island, you will be safe there. But the sad part of the story that's not being told is, and I don't know if anyone has been on, on Deer Island. Uh, the last time I've been there was in a, in a storm and this was sort of like a September hurricane. It was extremely windy. And all I could think about, man, being there in a nor'easter must really suck because the Native Americans were not allowed to cut any of the trees there. They were extremely poorly supplied with food. So you can just imagine being exposed to elements with your family, your wife, your children. And um, many people died and we have no idea how many because there is no sources there. Um, 
Nevertheless, when asked uh, by Puritan leaders like Benjamin Church, if they would volunteer on the side of the colony after a few months of internment camp, several of the men volunteered and went to fight. And in, in a sense, probably also hoping that they could eventually free their families. So they played a very important role in the defense uh, of Massachusetts Bay Colony, despite this horrific experience. After the war, at least 1,000 Native Americans are sold into Caribbean slavery. Some historians argue that number is as many as 2,000. Among them are King Philip's wife and his son. And many other, um, I'm up in the Lowell area, this community vanishes up north initially into New Hampshire and then probably for the mission towns in Canada and some probably to Sokoki and, and other towns in, in Western New York. So um, it leads to a big, big um, exodus of native people right in the aftermath of King Philip's War. But there are still many Native Americans, several thousand that remain in the colony despite this. And when you read textbooks, King Philip's War is often sort of the end of Native Americans in Southern New England. And that is simply not true. It's again, sort of this myth of the vanishing Indian. I have a, uh, another picture here uh, of Hannah Dustin. There is a, um, a statue of, of Hannah Dustin in downtown Haverhill. And this one is actually up in, uh, outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. And she's been in, and the statue has been in the, in the news as of late because Hannah, Hannah Dustin had, uh, been a captive, uh, had her own child slaughtered by Native Americans and had been evacuated and was just about to be brought to Canada. And so when, uh, when she was in a camp up on the Merrimack River, really outside of Manchester where the statue is put up, her and three, two other um, white captives decided, all right, we're gonna kill 10 Native Americans. And we're gonna scalp them uh, because we tend to think Native American scalping, but in fact, by the sword, we seek peace. Uh, colonial New England governments paid very good money for Native American scalps. And Hannah Dustin and her, um, the white uh, captives that she had been with got a, a nice payout. Um, but anyway, so uh, really only one man of fighting age in this group of 10. He was killed first. An old man was killed next, two women, and then six children were quickly uh, extinguished and had their uh, hair removed, which then Hannah Dustin brought back. And so this is why some native people say, should we really have a statue? At the same time, Hannah Dustin, and this is again, maybe a sad state of of, of gender relations in this country. This is the first woman on a statue in the United States. Imagine that. Um, so um, again, it's sort of this, uh, this uh, interesting, fascinating story in how we remember the past or don't remember the past. Um, now I am depressing myself and, and history is sometimes very depressing and, and I'm sorry, um, but as I said, what is also an important part of this story is the story of survival and indigenous persistence in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. So Native American history does not end in Southern New England or Northern New England for that matter with King Philip's War. So Native Americans survived and, and worked in the colony as slavery, as slaves and indentured servants. Christianity and, and the Christian religion had become a very um, central focus point for uh, many Southern New England communities, which is kind of ironic, right? Uh, but you had increasingly by the 18th century with Samson Ockham and in the 19th century, you had a lot of indigenous leaders like William Apis here on the picture that emerged in communities, they became educators, they became, uh, they became ministers. And so what is happening in New England is that Christianity is turned indigenous. 
And while white missionaries are not really all that successful necessarily among native communities, people like William Apis and Samson Ockham are very successful. <clears throat> They also work as teachers. So they're educating Native American people to read and write. And Native American, the history of literacy in New England is, is dramatic. Uh, from the praying towns to the later uh, Christian communities, Native American value that their children learn how to read and write. And they're quite adamant about it. And, and part of the reason is there's a missionary that is trying to uh, create a, a boarding school in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And, and the New England Native Americans, ah, go ask the Mohawks. We, we, we educate our own kids. Uh, and it's very clear that they're understanding. We need to educate our own kids as a way to become uh, communities that can survive. And, and William Apis does that, but then he is also, and, and, and Samson Ockham and, and many others, uh, Blind Amos and, and other Christian leaders in these communities, do all of that, but they also become political advocates and they become political lobbyists. So they also speak out to colonial governments and then later uh, New English state governments as advocates for the rights of their people. Native Americans work in factories like Betsy Guppy Chamberlain of Lowell, who is a, who's a person of, of, uh, of Native American descent Betsy also wrote for several of the, the paper, the Lowell Offering and the New England Offering. <clears throat> a lot of her writing had to deal with women's rights. Um, but she also wrote several pieces about indigenous rights and indigenous survival. And so it's very interesting how um, like Apis, Betsy Guppy Chamberlain reminds mainstream New England society, hey, Native Americans, we're still here uh, and, and, and we're having an impact and don't forget about us. Native Americans have a high participation rate in the whaling industry, which is also a very deadly industry. Uh, they work in agriculture, they work as domestic laborers. You have throughout the 19th and 18th century, these accounts how Indian peddlers are showing up Indian doctors and Indian performers. And these are Native Americans that dress probably just like any other person at the time. But when they go on selling their wares, they just put on what mainstream New English people would think is traditional Native American uh, garbs. And they're quite entrepreneurial in that sense. Native Americans work in construction. In Northern New England, they work in logging, river driving. Those are the people that are taking the trees down the river. Um, tourism trades, canoe making. So you have uh, a wide variety of economic niches in which Native Americans become specialized and, and, and survive in New England's uh, community. Also, a lot of Native Americans work as soldiers. So like the praying town men that got off Deer Island to fight for the English colonies, People in Southern New England, especially in Eastern Massachusetts, they will join the English in every war from King Philip's War down to King William's War, and I'm not gonna list them all because we're gonna be here tomorrow, uh, up to the American Revolution and the War of 1812. In fact, all Native Americans in New England side on the side of the Americans in the American Revolution, which then the New English very quickly forget Oh, we can take your land anyway. Thanks for nothing. Um, but that's a different story. So um, because of the high participation rate in, in the military, but also in the whaling industry, where people are often gone for two to three years, which has a very high mortality rates, what ends up happening, there is a, uh, a decline of the male population uh, as compared to the female population. And so Native American women are often in search of a partner, and they satisfy that need with people from outside the community. So they end up intermarrying with African Americans, or they intermarry with European Americans, which kind of explains why people like Garrett, when he picked a Montana Indian, was very representative of many in 19th century New English societies. 
that they had said, well, there has been so much intermixing going on that these people are just no longer Native American. But in a sense of community, yes, there might be outsiders living in the communities, but it's still women in many instances that control the farmland, that get to call the shots. The kids still grow up learning Native American and they're connected to their Native American languages and they're connected to, to their communities. So from an indigenous perspective, these people consider themselves as native people. They live on reserves and they very much have this as part of their, as their, of their identity. But the racist notion of the time, the one blood rule, et cetera, et cetera, connected to the history of slavery <clears throat> is that the mainstream society thinks that black blood is stronger than Native American blood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very complex history, but to make a long story short, uh, what ends up happening uh, is that the Southern New England state governments use these, um, <clears throat> these developments to argue, well, Native American people aren't really pure Native Americans anymore, so we are now terminating their reserves. And so throughout Southern New England, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, Connecticut, many of the remaining reserves uh, are terminated. And pretty much the state government says, okay, you're no longer Native American. You no longer have a reservation or a reserve. It's all dissolved. Everyone gets a little bit of land and the rest of the land we sell and uh, the, the state government benefits from the profit. And that is it. Now you can also vote in elections. And most Native Americans, A, didn't want to vote in the elections, and they wanted their communities to be maintained. And from termination into the late 20th century, and still to this day in, in several communities, Native Americans fought termination tooth and nail. So once they were terminated, when, when the termination process was going on, they were fighting it, and after, the, after termination, constantly taking things to the court, uh, constantly uh, trying to wage battles to say that these terminations have been illegal. And we can explore the reasons why Native Americans actually had a pretty good ground to make that legal argument. And, and the courts agreed with them by the 1870s, uh, six, starting in the 60s, 80s, 70s and 80s. Um, and so that, is a process termination continued to be challenged by many native people. But there is um, continued visibility in sports. There's various native American famous marathon runners, um, baseball players, uh, native Americans are trying to stay visible in a society that often pretends they don't exist. And I am picking Joseph Nicolar uh, of the Penobscot Indian and Gladys Tantequidgen of the Mohegan as just two stands in, just like Betsy Guppy Chamberlain <coughs> and Apis were two examples of how Native Americans remind people that we're still here, we're still active and we're surviving. Now, Joseph Nicolar uh, was a self-taught man he wrote this for like 1890s, especially extremely brilliant book. I mean, he was sort of 80 years, 90 years ahead of, uh, of many anthropologists and the ways of analyzing things for someone that is self-taught is just an incredible, incredible source. And, and it becomes a good way to sort of get a glimpse, an indigenous glimpse at the history. Gladys Tantequidgen, um, she was trained as a traditional uh, medicine person, um, but she also obtained a PhD in anthropology from UPenn. So she straddled those two worlds. And what Gladys did, she worked in the New Deal era in, in, in out west to help communities retain their sovereignty and so on, cultural artifacts, incredibly prolific woman. But at the same time, 
she also, with several of her family members, started to collect a lot of Mohegan artifacts and documents pertaining to the history of the Mohegan Indians. And it is these documents that the Tantaquidians gathered that enabled the Mohegans to make the, to obtain federal recognition uh, in later years. So it's this data set and sort of this astute collecting of evidence for years that enabled uh, the Mohegan nation to, to obtain federal recognition. And this is why people like Gladys Tantaquidgen, Joseph Nicolar are very important because they show their communities and, and, and working together with many other people in their communities. And there is other people in other communities just like them that continue to maintain uh, their people's uh, ways and, and try to maintain their cultures, traditions, and also fight for official recognition. I am noticing that I am about 40 some minutes of talking time. So I'm trying to wrap it up so that we actually have time for discussion and questions. Other legacies of colonization have to do with the welfare of Indian children. Just like other parts of North America, New England is certainly impacted by the boarding schools and residential schools. And there is Native American children throughout the Northeast that end up in, in various of these schools. And this continues into, well, the federal boarding schools are closed in the 1930s, but there's various religious institutions that continue to run <coughs> much later. The other issue, of course, is that of family separation. And that is taking Native American children away from their Native American family, often usually only for the one reason, that is uh, that there are Native American children. The boarding school and schools and family separation, and if you're interested in the issue of family separation, uh, the, the documentary Dawnland provides a nice glimpse into uh, in Supposedly family separation is outlawed in 1978 by Congress. Uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act is that piece of legislation. But in the state of Maine, it continues somehow for several decades afterward. And there has been a big Truth and Reconciliation Commission now trying to sort of make sense to what happened here and how maybe reconciliation or truth can be brought out. Uh, it's a very complex and hard thing to do. So check out Dawnland if this is something you're interested in exploring more. But it is excruciating when you talk to boarding school survivors or you, you talk to people that have undergone, you get some very heart-wrenching testimonies in Dawnland. When you talk to these survivors about the, the intergenerational trauma that these things have of drug abuse, family violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a legacy that goes on for generations afterwards. And, and uh, the legacies of that native societies all over the United States and New England will have to deal with for quite some time to come. The persisting legacies and challenges. Uh, What has happened since World War II, but a process that had really started before, as we can see uh, with Tantaquidgen, Native people following uh, various nationalist movements, uh, calls for sovereignty and, and political activism have become quite vocal. So we have the day of mourning celebrations where people meet uh, on Coles Hill above uh, Plymouth Rock and demonstrate for about 50 some years at this point, uh, reminding mainstream New English society, yeah, eat your turkey, but wasn't so good for us. Uh, you have state and federal recognition that Native Americans have been going to the courts and have been going to the courts and have been saying, termination is illegal. State governments cannot terminate Native American societies. And then the court saying, yeah, you're right. It's the correct constitutional interpretation, but you're in New England. So there's a colonial precedent. And at some point, white judges just said, what the heck is colonial precedent anyway? 
and shouldn't the constitution apply to everyone equally? <clears throat> and so this whole colonial uh, interpretation was thrown out the window, which helped uh, various communities in New England to gain state and federal recognition. Uh, as many rural communities and communities all over North America, economic and cultural revitalization is a big issue. Uh, COVID is a big issue in indigenous communities. And so is the opioid crisis. Uh, yes, it hits communities all over North America hard, but it seems to be hitting certain communities harder. And among these certain communities, when you look at the data, Native Americans seem to become uh, get hit especially hard. Language preservation, uh, for example, the Wampanoag uh, Language Preservation Project and many others, this is another area in which Native Americans are very much trying to maintain their cultures and revitalize their cultures. And I think I have talked now for almost 50 minutes, so it's definitely time for me to <coughs> get out of here, out of the share, if it lets me and roll it over to the audience. Thank you, Christoph. We do have a few questions in the chat. Um, first one, we're about to mark Thanksgiving. Based on your research, is there much to celebrate considering how First Nation folks were treated? So you covered that a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> well, as some of you might tell by my accent, I'm a foreigner. So um, some of the first Thanksgiving I celebrated in the United States was with Native American friends on, on reserves, reservations in Western New York. And so, yes, you can celebrate Thanksgiving. There's a lot in Thanksgiving and there's a lot of things to be thankful for. Just as with the state seal, be aware that there is a whole history that's quite complex. Uh, but I also think, at least in my reality right now, I, I feel like, boy, it's surreal how fortunate I have been compared to so many other people. And that is something to be thankful for. And so there is also this kind of non-historical and we celebrations, holidays change all the time and it is very much cultures that shape celebrations. Americans used to not celebrate Christmas and now we do. So I'm thinking just embrace it, be aware of the kind of history of colonization and uh, try to do better in the future. So that I guess that's my quick answer to this. Yeah, it reminds me in your book, um, you take great pains to go over how difficult it is to use the colonial historians um, documenting things because they're looking at everything through a racist lens, through a gender biased lens, through their preconceived notions about who should do agriculture, like they didn't respect the natives because the women were in charge, you know, these kind of things that you have to consider the source. Yeah. And everything is nuanced. Okay, we have another one. Do you know of any stories of Native American sisters or daughters who were married to Englishmen, sort of like Malin? No, oh, I can't say that name. In Mexico, um, Guanina in the Puerto Rican Republic, or um, even maybe Pocahontas. And what is your take on that, sisters to leaders? There is there is a bit of intermixing going on, and especially with the African American community. And so, I can't. I mean, there is Eunice Williams, right, that gets pulled out of uh, Deerfield, the daughter of a Puritan minister, that then. Uh, uh, marries a Mohawk. So yes, there's examples of that. I think that <clears throat> Anglo-American culture is maybe a little bit more race conscious than, than say French culture is and, and Spanish culture, not to suggest that there isn't racism and systemic problems in those societies, but, but there's also a certain element of machismo and what happens in, in Mexico society and when, when the, the Spanish conquer the, the Aztec empire, right? For the conquistadores getting an Aztec wife or a Mexica wife becomes sort of your point of legitimacy. Okay, I married in your nobility. And so it becomes politically astute. That's certainly not the case in New England, but there is certainly 
relationships that happen like that all the time. And there's always messed up power dynamics here too, especially if it's servants and slaves uh, that are probably very parallel to some of the things that are going on in, um, in like the Jefferson household. And, uh, oh, right. And, right. And I, I think there are a few instances that you know, we've heard of of captives who've chosen to stay yeah. after they, especially if they were captured as children, that's like yeah. the culture that they know. And so I'm sure it's very individual as well. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Um, if you could speak on the alliances that the Native Americans made with the English compared to the French in the Northern New England region. So, can can the person maybe specify what they mean by Northern New England? So I'm thinking like Maine or does, does Andrew, it mean- do you wanna unmute yourself and- Yeah, and please- Tell us. Um, earlier you just spoke about, uh, and, and or just really the, the decision-making that went in between choosing between the French. I knew that they were more potentially a viable option with Champlain and maybe a different treatment towards the natives than the English. And I think you infer that they went with the English and I wanted to maybe know why, or if you, if you knew more about that. Yeah, I mean, as much as you can pretend anything that happened 400 years ago. Um, so for people like Osama Quinn, or as he's often called Massasoit, that's actually the, 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 the title of the uh, Wampanoag leader, but, but Osama Quinn was his name, but let's call him Massasoit now. I mean, he clearly looks for an alliance with the Puritan settlers. Um, are people, everyone in Wampanoag society happy about this? I am doubtful. And from the records, the few that are surviving, there is indications that a lot of people in his communities give him grief about this. Um, so, but when you look at this, so many people died that the English were seen as a vital ally against groups further in the interior. Um, so this will be a Southern New England example of why people, why native people like the Wampanoags would initially have and see good relations with, uh, with the English, which would actually maintain until the 1670s when the pressures and, of English on, on the Wampanoags got so strong that many of them couldn't handle it many more. But there were also many Wampanoags that decided, no, we're gonna stick with the English. And then several of them ended up to, on, on the slave markets of the Atlantic world. Uh, so that is always an issue that I live up in Lowell where you have the, uh, the, the Panacook community and there is sort of an, 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 an effort in the 1640s to find an alliance with the English uh, against the Mohawks, but what the, the, the Panacook up here realizes, yeah, now we have this alliance system and we have all these constraints put on us by the English, but the Mohawks are still coming and we're getting no help. Uh, in the context of New England, Northern New England, so what is today the surviving communities like the Pusmaquoddy, the Penobscot, uh, the Maliseet, I think there it's not so much hot love for the French, but they're increasingly aware that English uh, put more pressures on their communities and that the French are potential allies in trying to stop that bleeding and stop that advance. And for people in the praying towns that are surrounded by all English colonies, there's really no other option but to say, yes, we fight along you guys because that increases our survivability. So it's about geographic location. It's about trying to maintain power dynamics and all those factors Andrew play in there. So I, I hope I kind of give you a very long winded uh, answer to what is actually a very good and essential question to, to uh, trying to summarize 400 history of incredible colonial indigenous relations here. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a seventh grade history teacher and I'm actually teaching the Wampanoags and the Pilgrims right now. And there is so much and uh, thank you. I, just the, uh, the idea that Massasoit, he, he was torn between where to go, even between his own tribe. It's good to know, thank you. And, and Christoph's book is full of sources. 
It's a very good survey. So plugging and in. I think they have a copy of it at the sale. We have a copy of the Athenaeum, but Andrew, you're, I think you're going to need one for your reference going forward because um, it's really good just, you know, looking at all of the histories that exist, some of which, many of which are very, very specific. So Christoph's book does a survey of New England. So that's what sets it apart. We have another question. Uh, can you recommend a source where we can view a map of where in New England, which tribes lived? I'm sighing because it's again, it's a very excellent question and it's so hard to answer because when and where is really hard. So when we're talking about communities, we often use like 17th century, when I talk about the Penacook or we talk about the Wampanoags, we're using 17th century terms. What these communities called themselves before European colonization and before mass dying started to happen and before European uh, Native American communities had to regroup quite dramatically because entire settlements like Pawtucket, they disappear, right? It's a hard thing to do. So there is some good maps if you're looking at the historic period and I you just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll have, I'm happy to direct you to those. Uh, but maps are always fraught because they're fluid, right? And, and they're always, the map maker has certain perceptions and they're very much limited by the sources that we have, which very much favor European experiences. And a lot of the oral histories again, uh, <laughs> they are very limited because we have 400 years of colonization, disease, dying, and, and, and so much knowledge that's being lost. And even when we talk about, for example, to give you a specific example about how complex and weird the story is, right? I mentioned the Wopanok uh, language um, project, and they're using seven uh, Bibles to revitalize a language that has been written down by Eliot, the missionary, but he really was helped by many of these literate 17th century praying town Indians that then put this compendium together and they're now using this as a source to, to, to relearn and to, to re-educate the community in a language. So it's, it's a very fraught and it's a very complex process in trying to, to maintain and revitalize culture that is um, that really needs to be understood in like this 400 years uh, of, 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 of dramatic, uh, like just, it, it's so hard to like put a word on this, how complex and, and how weird and how violent and, and how destructive this stuff is really. Christoph, could you give just like a quick summary of the praying towns in case anyone's with us who doesn't know what they are? Oh, so the praying towns were these towns that you found, and I think there was 14, maybe two, three more, uh, that could be found all over Massachusetts Bay Colony. And so you had this guy, Elliot, who I think down his, the initial one, Dorchester. So Nadig was a praying town. Wamasee up in Lowell was a praying town. There were several others uh, around Grafton. Uh, and they were spread. And so these were Christian communities that had sort of this white missionary, Elliot, and then Gukin, who I mentioned earlier for the numbers, they showed up. But really these were communities that also had a lot of independence because it's the 17th century. And for someone like Elliot to get up to Lowell, that might happen once a year. So you have a lot of autonomous control by native communities. And so the, <laughs> it's really complex. So yes, do these Native Americans embrace Christianity to agree? Certainly, but this also provides these community with a legal title to the land. But at the same time, the colonial government gives legal title to the land. But what happens, for example, up in, in Lowell, which I'm most familiar with, yeah, you get, you get <laughs> the, the Wamasee, they get like a tile parcel that includes downtown Lowell. But the colonial government then creates Billerica and Chelmsford, which today still includes, uh, what is Tewksbury? Uh, and, and, and Dunstable and other communities as well. So it also is in a sense a, a colonial land grab. So, and again, this is kind of a hard history to like summarize in 45 minutes or even just a quick, quick history of the praying town. But I hope that makes it a little clearer and I'm not confusing people more. And if I am just speak up and uh, please ask. So the, was Elliot the primary mover with 
for the he was the primary mover and and, and shape shaper and and so is Gukin and and when sort of when these Native American people are put on uh, on Deer Island they're trying to like talk to um, other New English colonists and they're putting themselves into pretty hot water I mean Gukin lost public office and I am sure a lot of lucrative business uh, by standing up to a limited degree for Native Americans as much as he felt he could. And he probably was more courageous than I would have been in his position. And courage is something we only know really how much we have until we're really tested. Right, right. Are there any other questions for Christoph tonight? Comments? Any hands? Carolyn, do you see anyone? No? Well, thank you all so much. There were some great questions. And of course, thank you to Christoph. Oh, there's a question. Where do you teach? You want to talk about your program, Christoph? Oh, I teach up at UMass Lowell. Uh, uh, very nice place. Uh, yes, no. And uh, yeah, I like teaching. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great teacher, Christoph. Um, so one second here, I'm going to share our list of upcoming programs that I want to share with our audience. Um, I am sharing my screen, and it's not on the it's not the one I want to see. But here we go. All right. So upcoming, we have a writing workshop this Saturday. If you um, want to finish your novel for National Novel Writing Month, now's your chance to get some. Help, extra help with it before the end of the month. And then we have a lot of great stuff coming up. You can always visit our website or join our email list and find out more about things that are coming up. And as always, anyone can join and be a member. We're happy to welcome you, even though our, you know, somewhat limited right now during the pandemic, but uh, we can still see each other face to face via Zoom, which helps a lot on days like today and probably on Thanksgiving when we're all going to be doing this with our families. Um, so thank you all, Christoph. Thank well, you. Thank you all for making it out and uh, stay safe out there. And thank you very much. If any questions come up, uh, you find me on the UMass Lowell History website, Christoph. Uh, just shoot me an email and I'll try to field it as I can with the insanity of advising students through a pandemic and and all the other things, teaching and uh, taking care of homeschooling to, to, to little ones. And uh, yes, so shoot me a line and I, I will get back to you, I promise. If I don't get back to you, check the email. It's probably the wrong one, uh, but yes. Or you so, can contact us at the Athenaeum. I'll track them down if you have trouble. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Jean will get me. Right. <laughs> well, and we've had some great comments and some, you know, thanks from our audience members. So, Christopher, uh, thank you guys. All it's learned a pleasure. lot tonight. Take care. So we'll go into Thanksgiving with new eyes. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>